Right. <laughs> um, now you can hear me. So a very warm welcome to everybody, and especially the Lord Mayor for joining us at quite short notice. And um, he's going to be talking about uh, whatever he wants to talk about <laughs> um, in relation to um, the city of Westminster. Um, Jonathan Glanz, he's um, a council member, of course, as well, representing the West End, which, of course, is a um, very important part of Westminster. Uh, in fact, Westminster has got 50,000 businesses, well, at least it did before the pandemic, um, in all sectors, you know, major hospitality, retail, the nighttime economy, as we call it, you know, clubs and casinos, theatres, art galleries, you name it, Westminster's got it and employs a huge number of people. All of that has been really um, mucked about by, by pandemic. And um, so that may be something the Lord Mayor's gonna touch on. But as a councillor um, as well, he's the lead member for broadband and uh, connectivity, uh, which is incredibly important uh, because it, when I was first in Westminster, the, the broadband connections were, as, uh, well, actually they were better in Iceland than in Westminster, and yet Westminster's got all these companies and people were cycling into different parts of Soho or rather going on well, whichever form of transport they could just to find a connection. But, but um, driven by Jonathan, uh, Westminster is now in within the top 10 of local authorities with, with uh, good connections and, um, and so on. So that's, that's really very important. At the same time as being a councillor, the Lord Mayor, um, he doesn't stop running for charity. Um, so we lots of um, lots of uh, marathons and half marathons. And the other aspect I just wanted to mention is um, each mayor chooses a charity, and, and Jonathan supports the, um, the Centre Point charity at the moment. He may mention something about that. So we're delighted that you come to talk to us, Jonathan, and we're going to have some questions. Um, sorry, I should say Lord Mayor. I, I feel I know you so well <laughs> over the years. <laughs> I should be more formal. But um, a very warm welcome. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And, and then it's very kind of you to take questions on presumably a variety of subjects. So may I introduce the Lord Mayor of Westminster, the City of Westminster, um, Jonathan Glanz, Councillor Jonathan Glanz. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, for that uh, introduction. And I'm very happy to be here today. Um, obviously, in normal times, we would be meeting in person in your very fine building there, uh, which I've been to on many occasions, and I look forward to uh, coming to it as conditions allow. Uh, you've alluded to uh, the changes which you've all had to make, this being one of them. We're now uh, regular users of Zoom and Teams and other, uh, other things, and um, I was the first councillor, to uh, the first Lord Mayor, to be appointed um, virtually. I've yet to, um, to chair an actual meeting of the council, although I hope to do so before my term of office comes to an end. Um, it is, you know, a, an extraordinary time that, we're, uh, that we've been living through, an extraordinary year, I suppose, to be um, chosen as Lord Mayor. I sometimes think that they must have all got in a room and said, oh, what's the worst possible year that we could give Jonathan that uh, will mean <laughs> that he won't be able to do all the things that Lord Mayors are normally um, expected to do. But uh, of course, it was nothing like that. It's a you know set of circumstances over which uh, none of us have con had control, but something which has uh, changed our life um, in, in many, many ways. But before talking about business um, specifically, I'd like to just put a little bit of context about Westminster, uh, because I think it's relevant to um, the discussion about business. Uh, Westminster is eight and a half square miles in the centre of London, of which large chunks are parks. So if you think of the intensity of the activity which takes place within the, uh, the built areas, it really is an extraordinary place unlike anywhere else. I like to call it the centre of the centre of the universe and perhaps I'm biased in that respect, but I do feel that uh, one of the things that uh, you can say about London in general and Westminster in particular is whatever your interest may be, you're able to do it to the highest possible level, to a world standard uh, in, uh, in London and in many cases uh, within Westminster. And the scale of the economic activity is really quite extraordinary. I mean, Westminster has a larger GDP than quite a number of uh, European Union countries. Um, it has, it contributes more actually to the National Exchequer than does the City of London, although they're not always happy about that comparison. Uh, but, um, and it has, just my ward, West End, has a higher rateable value 
than the whole of Wales. So I think you know, those kind of things do give some idea of the scale of activity. And likewise, um, in terms of the collections of um, activity, which are unlike anywhere else, we have obviously more theatres, um, clubs, pubs, those kind of activities, as well as the being the seat of government, royalty, um, and uh, and uh, and many many embassies. But on those licensed premises, which are perhaps close to many of our hearts this week as they reopen, um, just my ward in West End, if it were to be an independent um, licensing authority, would be the third largest licensing authority in the country. So I think that gives you again some flavour as to you know the scope of just how much activity, how much business activity takes place uh, within Westminster. And I think we've touched on, uh, Elizabeth, you touched in your introduction on some of the aspects of, uh, of what is special within Westminster. And I had hoped in normal times to have been celebrating some of those um, areas of excellence which we find in Westminster, which include retail, because we have extraordinary retail offering on street, Regent Street, Oxford Street, you know, at the centre, but also areas of independent shops of um, small businesses which offer specialist um, products and services uh, in a way um, which is unlike anywhere else. Um, we have an amazing hospitality business um, and that I hope is now going to uh, bounce back with a vengeance. Um, I've seen some evidence with my own eyes since Monday of people willing to stand outside with their thick coats and hats and scarves um, to participate in that. And I know from many of the businesses that their, their orders are, are looking positive for the 17th of May when they were going to take people indoors again. And uh, hotels, um, we have amazing hotels, but of course they have suffered enormously, not just because of um, the, uh, the loss of uh, business generally, but of course the, the, the great reduction in national and international travel which has affected uh, Westminster disproportionately because of uh, the activities we have there. We have clubs of all descriptions, the Gentlemen's Club St St James's, nightclubs, special interest clubs, uh, music clubs, um, they are again something which is if not unique to, to Westminster, something which is very special about Westminster and the group of, uh, of clubs that we have are second to none. I've mentioned theatres, but more broadly, cultural activity in normal times within Westminster, which is widespread across music, the visual arts, um, as well as uh, theatre and the creative industries, which um, many of which are centred historically in and around Soho, but have now moved slightly further out to um, north of Oxford Street and, uh, and elsewhere, have you know, added a real flavour to uh, what goes on here in, um, in Westminster, uh, whether they're working on blockbuster films which get released through Hollywood or whether they're working on, uh, on uh, smaller um, things for uh, a more local market, the added value that they uh, put in place there is uh, really, you know, one of the great success stories that uh, that Westminster can refer to. And also, of course, we mustn't forget, particularly at this time, that uh, that Westminster is a is a, a very much a centre of excellence for medic the provision of medical services. Uh, not only um, do we have uh, two large hospitals, but we have private hospitals. We have. Um, Harley Street and the surrounding area as centres of excellence for the provision of um, private medicine and an increasing number of, um, of hospitals and, um, and facilities for complementary medicine and for um, things like physio, um, osteopathy, related medical services, real growth area within, uh, with, within Westminster and one which we've sought to encourage. And I'm not in any way forgetting, of course, offices because we have hundreds of thousands of people normally who, instead of working from home and sitting in front of their Zoom screens, um, come into Westminster and make the place tick by um, pr providing not only that activity, but their spending power in the local shops and the pubs and the, uh, and the uh, other activities. So, so it's a very interesting and um, unusual group of activities which have all worked in together and given this, uh, this sort of unique character to Westminster. Now, all of those 
of businesses have suffered greatly over the last uh, year or so. And one of the things that Westminster Council, um, I know is working very hard to do now is to find ways in which uh, we can help those businesses get back on their feet. And although my role is pure, purely ceremonial rather than strategic or um, executive in relation to uh, what happens at the council, you know, I do see my role as supporting business, as supporting those activities, as doing what I possibly can to fly the flag so that we can set about this uh, re-emergence from uh, the, uh, the lockdown over the next few weeks and months and put Westminster exactly back where it ought to be, which is at the top of the tree in relation to all of these activities and rebuild that rather um, uh, unusual ecosystem which relates to the unusual mix of activities which take place here. Because one of the things which people don't always realise is that Westminster is, in, the, in a business context, is very much a series of layers. If you walk down the street, there will be activity in the basements of properties, which may be different from the business activity on the ground floor of properties, which may be different from the business activity on the first and second floor of property. And these businesses may not only operate in different um, areas of activity, they often also operate at different times of the day. So, you know, we will have things which happen in the morning, during the day, in the evening and at night. So there are different aspects of that ebb and flow of that shared space, uh, which is so um, evident in central parts of the city, whether it be uh, Mayfair or Marylebone or um, Queensway or whatever, you've got all this mix of activities which are taking place not only in shared space but at different times within shared space and that you know i think uh, adds to the uh, unusual complexity which um you know which which we face and we you know people often think of westminster as being a place where you know, it has huge headquarters buildings and we do have huge headquarters buildings but we also have an extraordinary number of smes small businesses micro businesses businesses which employ you know, five people, 10 people, two people, um, all the way through providing those services, whether it's professional services, whether it's in those creative industries to which I've talked about, the, you know, the, um, the unique and, um, and independent uh, retailers, the specialist um, medical providers, all of those are, are here. And I think 50,000, I hope is still an accurate estimate, I very much hope that it will be something which will increase from there because I've seen general statistics about businesses, new businesses being created. Uh, I'd like to think that uh, Westminster has uh, it, its fair share of, uh, of those and we'll see as the, uh, the stats become a bit clearer. Um, so that's really trying to give a little bit of context. Um, I'm not sure that I can add hugely to the particular problems that um, have been faced by businesses, but I am optimistic that although we've had a really um, difficult year, um, one that I had not expected to see in terms of all the various um, elements of Westminster being so special, being attacked at the same time, um, that we will bounce back. I'm concerned for some individual businesses that although there will be a restaurant on a site in Charlotte Street or in, uh, in uh, Old Compton Street or whatever, it may no longer be owned and operated by the same people that operated it before the pandemic. But I think that in terms of the business mix, um, there, there will be um, that because people want to eat, people want to drink, people want to get together. We're not creating some kind of new product which we have to sell. We're just giving people back what they've been uh, deprived of um, and in some cases so frustrated not to have uh, for the last year. So. As we've seen from, I think, uh, the early indications of the uh, reopening this week, uh, both in retail, where we've seen queues outside shops, where we've seen people keen to be involved in um, eating and drinking at our excellent establishments, um, that those things are here to stay. And as I said, at Westminster, we will do everything that we can really to encourage those businesses to bounce back, to help them in in, in any ways that we as a council can and to lobby for them with national government where the powers that we 
um, we don't hold, um, don't allow us to, uh, to, uh, to do those things directly. So, as I said, I do think there is um, an opportunity to build back quickly and hopefully in some cases to build back better, having learned some of the, um, the issues around um, the challenges that some of the, um, the more um, generic businesses um, having gone may give us a chance to backfill with more interesting and different and independent businesses on our high streets and uh, on our speciality shopping streets. Uh, and uh, I hope that that is something that will create that additional opportunity. Um, likewise, there may be particular places where um, buildings will change use because there has undoubtedly been a shift in the attitude towards how people shop. Um, and we may find that, that um, some of the places which have been traditionally only associated with retail or only associated with offices will find that they have to broaden what they do in order to uh, maintain the occupancy and the vibrancy of those areas. And I, again, I think that one of Westminster's great strengths is this mixed uh, use, cheap by jowl, uh, between various activities. It gives us its character, it gives us its strength. And if we can, uh, if we can retweak that and, and help curate that in a positive way, then I hope that we can, as I say, come back with something um, which when all the visitors come back, the national and the international visitors, which of course is, um, is so important to many of the businesses, they will come back and find that they've got something even better. Anyway, that's probably enough from me. I've waffled on enough, but I'm very happy to, uh, to take questions on any aspect of what I've talked about this, this evening, or indeed any aspect of what I do as Lord Mayor or what Westminster does. If it's something that's within my uh, knowledge, I'm very happy to, uh, um, to discuss it. So really, uh, thank you for that. Thank you for listening. And over to you for any questions that you might have. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I um, just want to welcome Indigit, who's joined us. Hi, Indigit. Can you hear us? Um, who would like to ask the first question? Can I see a hand up? Yes, Janet. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, that was very, very interesting uh, because uh, I'm living here in Berlin equally a large city which is uh, trying to cope with the pandemic uh, with very similar um, problems and uh, challenges uh, as you have. Um, but something I wanted to actually ask you, uh, uh, you say that you are, uh, you've chosen your uh, charity to be uh, the center point, which is very well known and has been going, I believe, for many, many years. Um, You've mentioned so many things about how businesses are managing in, in the pandemic and um, how things will probably change when we finally get on top of it. What about young people who are homeless? Ha have you seen a, a rise in uh, the number of uh, homeless in, in the city of Westminster? Uh, how are you trying to help people who are homeless? Um, and what resources do you have at your fingertips for that sort of thing? Well, thank you, Janet. It's a very, very good question because, you know, I, it is something which is very close to my heart. Uh, I've had um, roles within the council which have touched directly on that particular challenge. And obviously the West End in many ways is a magnet for people uh, to come, even if they don't have a, a home to go to. Um, Centrepoint focuses specifically on the needs of young people in the hope that they can get people out of a, um, a situation where they may become um, accustomed to living rough or living on the, or on the streets, so that, that that you know that journey can be um, sort of interrupted and an independent life can be achieved. And therefore, that's why I've chosen to work with them because, unfortunately, um, as you, as obviously you're well informed on this and you're aware that um, that actually people living on the streets have a comparatively low life expectancy. Many people have issues, health issues, mental health issues, issues around um, substance dependency, uh, which combined with poor diet, lack of access to um, medical facilities means that unfortunately, 
by the time somebody is um, 40-ish, they'll have done well to still be living on the streets and their expectation is unlikely to get to 50 um, if, they've, if they've had that kind of um, uh, experience. So the, the aspect of Centrepoint is to get people to work with others, including the council and other providers, to get people off the streets where they can start to rebuild their lives, to give them a base from which they can, can work. And it's something uh, which is known as the Helsinki model, where you put the property first, as opposed to putting the property last, which is has been the experience of other people. They, they say, well, you can't, you know, you can't have a home until you've done this, or until you've got a job, or until you've got rid of your dog, or until you've come off, off um, methadone, or whatever it may be. But, uh, center point puts uh, puts the home first and then rebuilds the life from there and that's why it works particularly well with that younger cohort who haven't become necessarily habituated to life on the street but more generally Westminster I mean as a council we spend 7.3 million of our own money annually in outreach work which we do through um, uh, working with charities and others so we work with not uh, with uh, the passage i don't know whether you know uh, them but they are based at the um at the cathedral westminster cathedral we work with the west london mission who are based uh, in, in in the north of the borough we work uh, with um with uh, um st mungo's and we work with um connections at st martin in the field all of whom have particular cohorts of people with whom they work and we have worked also with government during this pandemic who have provided extra funds to get people off the streets. And one of the, uh, one of the things that has happened because hotel occupancy has gone down has meant that there have been an opportunity to get people off the streets into accommodation and then wrap around the services from there, talk to them about their medical needs, talk to them about their uh, addiction issues, talk to them about what they want to be doing and where they want to be doing it. But having said all of that, there is still a small core of people who actually choose that lifestyle and who actually like the camaraderie and they like the bright lights and they like the feeling that they are in the center of things. And, it, and, and they like, in some cases, the access to um, some of the things that they uh, are interested in buying. And, and they, of course, are aware that um, London whilst the streets aren't paved with gold, um, if they are seeking to raise money either for their habits or for other things, then Central London provides that opportunity. Uh, we have within that cohort organised beggars who are professionally um, out on the streets. In some cases, um, they receive a, a, a target from their gangmasters. It's kind of like a, a kind of um, modern slavery. They are shipped in from Romania, Bulgaria, other countries, they are told that they have to raise a certain amount of money out of that money, otherwise their families will suffer. Um, and out of that money, they have to pay their gang masters, etc. So the people that you see with the, uh, the piece of cardboard, I don't know whether you have the same in Berlin, but they're straight out of central casting, as it were, the cardboard changes hands, the, the panhandle changes hands, etc. as their shift changes, changes over, and they're literally brought in and out to play that role in uh, the centre of Westminster. Not unusual for um, somebody to make five, six hundred pounds a day in cash, um, which is you know, not bad, um, tax-free. Um, and uh, certainly the police tell me that, in, that they have arrested beggars who've had several thousand pounds in cash on them. So it is quite a complex area and looking at people on the street and assuming that they are one thing or another is an assumption too far. It's, as I said, it's a complex area. Westminster is focused on getting people off the streets, but unfortunately, there is always somebody new that comes along. And whilst we work with the GLA and others on the, uh, an initiative called um, No Second Night Out, i.e. that our outreach teams go and find people before they reach that second night, um, and although we've had, um, during the cold weather, uh, additional indoor resource available, 
we do have a core of people who refuse to go indoors. And, um, and as I said, it's part of the broader understanding. We often get blamed for it as a council. Why haven't you done this? But people don't understand that there is no power that the local authority hold, or indeed the police hold, to require somebody to go into accommodation. So whilst we do our best, and I'm sure there are areas where we could do better, there are aspects of a complex area which aren't always um, easily known to people who, you know, who sort of walk along the streets and say, why are these people here? It's, there is a multiplicity of reasons as to why they're there. Some are, you know, uh, are very sad indeed, uh, people running away from all sorts of abuse. Some are somewhat more mercenary. So I hope that, you know, that, that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you very much for such a full and caring answer. Um, Indigit, you had your hand up. Question. Thank you. Um, can I firstly apologise that I had another commitment and I only joined you uh, as you were basically speaking uh, a few minutes earlier. Um, I, I declare an interest. I'm a former uh, executive director at Centrepoint in my career <laughs> <laughs> uh, when Diana, Princess of Wales, was our patron. Um, and uh, what I mean, I, I commend you for the in-depth knowledge that you have about rust sleeping, in particular young people. Um, it's uh, not very often that you hear a politician or a representative of local government uh, talking so, so, so much detail and so much knowledge. Um, and thank you for that. Um, I mean, two things I wanted to say. I'm, I'm, I'm still volunteering uh, in Camden and also in Westminster. Uh, there's an organization called Under One Sky. Uh, we've been going um, since the pandemic. Um, so we go out in the evenings and feed uh, and provide clothing and blankets and whatever is required, um, particularly um, from people who are afraid of the authorities. Uh, they don't want to go into a hostel. They don't want to go to a hotel, given the government's given this extra funding over the pandemic. Um, it's remarkable that the target was clear the streets within two years. It was done within two weeks. And if there's a will, uh, there is a way. And it's been done. And, and the difficulty I think now we face is, I don't know if you agree, is that those hotels are being asked to be sort of uh, desanitized and they want those homeless people gone. Uh, so there's a commercial angle to this. Uh, you know, it was good while it lasted. The issue now will be where do these homeless people move on to? And in relation to young people, there's a double-edged sword in the sense that if you're under the age of 18, under the age of 25 or 21, uh, the welfare system isn't there to support you. And that's where Centerpoint came in. We, I mean, I used to pick up young people with our team coming into King's Cross on the train as young as 12 years old, who basically had difficulties with their parents or their, uh, they've, they've been looked after and, and the institutions weren't working so well for them. And the pimps used to be the first to get there if we didn't get there in King's Cross. And we, we had a shelter not very far from there and that still operates today. And Diana, Princess of Wales, used to bring her two sons uh, under the cover of darkness uh, every six to seven months to show them what real life was all about. Um, so there's that angle, and 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 Centre Points benefited from that uh, connection from the past, and it continues to do well. And there's other charities. The other thing I wanted to just raise with you was that in the last, I was going to say, what what is the question, in the question is, <laughs> Do you think do you think that there's there, there's so many different organisations um, that are trying to help and support during the pandemic in Central London? Um, there is a rotor system that please has implemented. Has, has that got the blessing of the local authority like yourself and Camden? I'm just wondering if there is a clear link with the policing and the local authority wishes to see these organisations perhaps spread out a bit more. Sorry, Elizabeth. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. I, I just, before I uh, come to your, your question, I'd just like to comment on, on this issue about people being in hotels during the pandemic and now being required to move out of them or being encouraged to move out of them. I would like to hope that the process itself of getting people into the hotel, albeit for that period of time, has shown people who were perhaps reticent 
about going indoors for whatever reason or going into that, that there is a way forward and that that window of time has been used by organisations such as yours and many other volunteers to sort of encourage people to, um, to stay in, uh, under a roof rather than, uh, than go back on to, onto the streets when, um, uh, when uh, this current arrangement comes to an end. In terms of coordinating um, the work of a large number of volunteers, um, some of which are Westminster based and some of which come into Westminster in order to, uh, you know, to help with this, it can be quite tricky. Um, a particular example was there was work being done at the American church in Tottenham Court Road uh, and work being done at, in St. Patrick's Soho Square. Um, and there was some, you know, there, there was, uh, there was some um, sort of um, congruency between the user groups and um, they were, you know, they were able, because of the close physical uh, location, to address that, to, I think, um, ensure that it was fairer and more effective uh, for everybody. I think one of the challenges is, is that Westminster isn't always aware of uh, who is doing what within Westminster. You know, we've seen examples of people who've driven in from Maidenhead because they wanted to bring food or soup or, 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 or blankets or whatever. Um, and then at the end of the evening, drive out of Maidenhead, back up, and we have no real interaction with them, and knowing what they're doing and how they're working with, uh, with other people. So there is a, there is a, a, a real uh, issue around coordinating um, the volunteer works, the charity works, the outreach work, um, etc. Um, I'm not certain if there is an easy answer to that, uh, but I do know that our outreach teams try to ensure that um, the, the help which is available is spread evenly and spread to those uh, in, in particular need um, of whatever uh, is being offered. And I know that they liaise okay. with, um, with colleagues in Camden, uh, Kensington, and Chelsea and elsewhere, because this isn't a problem which sort of is defined by one side of Tottenham Court Road or the other. It's, you know, it's a problem which we, uh, we, we share in central London, which we need to uh, address in a coordinated way. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, another question? Um, yeah, Sina. S Sina. Sina, you said it. Sina, sorry, Sina. Yeah. Um, so uh, during the introduction, although I was vacant from my desk, my camera was off, I was searching for my charger, so apologies for that. Uh, but I heard Elizabeth mention that you'd helped increase connectivity in the city of Westminster. And uh, I was doing a few Google searches in the background and I, 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 I read that you, uh, um, you had introduced fiber to the home and uh, myself working on a few similar projects in the Commonwealth. I'm interested to know what are the uh, the challenges you faced, how you overcame those challenges, and uh, some general thoughts on on the, on the entire process. Okay. Well, it, it was quite an interesting um, brief which I got when we were 635th out of 650 constituencies in in the country, where sort of evidenced by. Grant Chatsy's broad bag, as he called it, um, uh, survey. And that was quite an eye opener because people assumed, I think, uh, you know, Elizabeth assumed um, that because we have a seat of government and because we have all these big organizations, there is necessarily service available to everybody. What actually was going on was that the big boys were having lease lines, they were making their own arrangements. And if it costs a thousand or ten thousand pounds a month, that, and you're running a huge hedge fund, then that's fine. It didn't help the guy next door who's running a small, um, you know, estate agency or trying to uh, conduct a, uh, you know, a, a, a teleconference as a medical practitioner, because they were not willing or able to take on the uh, the cost of a lease line, and um, because that was such a lucrative business. Our friends at Open Reach or Closed Reach, as I used to refer to them, um, uh, were unwilling to make the investment in central London to take F uh, fibre to the, to the premises because they were getting so much money from the lease lines that it wasn't in their interest to upgrade to gigabit connectivity for not much more money. So we had to look at another way and look at that as an opportunity 
but there was a vacuum there that could be filled. And we sort of encouraged through a range of measures at Westminster, including lowering the cost of suspending parking to allow for street works, uh, including um, putting together a grant scheme for SME so that they got 2,000 pounds, or up to 2,000 pounds towards connectivity. Um, and uh, working with um, Community Fiber on a group of assets with our own properties, our own 21,000 council houses, as it were, uh, working with the great estates who in, you know, control and are um, concerned with the management of large tracts of Westminster, working with them, we found that we were able to address some of the big gaps. And then for a series of, I call it osmosis, it spread from there. So every time, for instance, we authorized a fiber installation to one of our council buildings, we insisted that fiber was then made available to the immediate surrounding area. Every time we worked with, um, with the Grosvenor Estate or the Howard de Walden Estate or the Portman Estate to look at a rollout to, uh, to serve uh, the streets which were part of, uh, of their um, uh, areas, we would work with them to ensure that everybody knew that this option was available. So um, if you look at the connectivity map, I don't know whether you have seen it on your, uh, on your thing, uh, you know, you, you can see these sort of nodes which then spread out to fill the gaps. Now, not all the gaps are filled, and there are some pretty startling gaps still uh, where you think, oh, they must have, you know, state of the art there, but they haven't because they fall between the stools. One of the particular challenges in Westminster is cobbled news, uh, cobbled news, and the cost effectiveness of taking up the cobbles, putting in fiber to each premises and putting them back again has been a challenge which we've yet to crack fully. Um, also, small blocks of flats with individual landlords that don't want to enter into a whaling agreement. So the big blocks, you know, 50 flats or whatever, 100 flats, you tend to have a more sophisticated owner who see the benefit for them of having connectivity of, um, uh, you know, gigabit capability, each of their flats. But on the smaller blocks, Oh no, what happens if you go bust, you know, et cetera. We need to leave the wiring there. Uh, you know, we're concerned that you're going to breach the firewall, you know, the, the fire protection, et cetera. So those are the kind of challenges that we, uh, that, that we face, but we really have through a sort of dogged determination of approaching it from the ground up, from the top down with the major landowners, um, through, uh, the grant scheme, et cetera, managed to fill many not yet all of those gaps. Um, and if you've got a good idea for public news, happy to please share it with me. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Sandy Dam, you, you've, you've got a question. Thank you. Sandy. Yes. <clears throat> good evening. Good evening. You, you did mention the, the, the amount of, of SMEs you had in, in Westminster. How how do you see them coping for the, the double tsunami which has hit them now with Brexit first on COVID then? How do you see them coming out of that? Okay, well, I mean, the SMEs that we have here are in, uh, involved in all sorts of businesses. Some have been affected by Brexit, some haven't. Um, and, you know, we're, we have um, certainly at Westminster, we've encouraged uh, not only um, people uh, to... Uh, complete their settlement arrangements, you know, and to register uh, if they've been here. We're encouraging um, uh, everybody that is entitled to that to do so, and we've supported that through um, a uh, allocation of resource to help people who have got more challenging cases. I must say that, you know, uh, you know my wife, who is Italian, uh, went on to the app and it took about 10 minutes, and, and it was all, all done, but I've known horror stories of people who been here for a long period of time who have real difficulties in ticking the next necessary boxes. So we've tried to help individuals in that respect um, get through those particular challenges. In terms of the pandemic, obviously we've, we've uh, uh, been very pleased that effectively business rates have been um, suspended for, uh, for most businesses, uh, if not all SMEs, because of the type of properties which they occupy. Uh, we've also 
allocated millions of pounds of additional grants uh, to uh, businesses and trying to continue to support them through further allocation uh, of grants. Um, in terms of some specific businesses, you'll be aware that we uh, we relax the rules in relation to on-street um, trading for restaurants and bars, so that uh, although there had previously been quite a cumbersome process of um, applying for licenses, we've tried to streamline that, and we have made whole streets, 90 streets across Westminster, um, special areas where um, you know they have been able to uh, be encouraged to spill out and trade from the street. So not just Soho, but areas you know um, in uh, you know, parts of you know uh, St John's Wood or Queensway or Pimlico have also been encouraged to take parts of what had previously been highway or pavement um, to uh, allow them to start trading where they haven't got their own outdoor space. Uh, and I suspect that it's going to be quite a difficult one to put back in the box. Um, that may not be universally welcomed by residents, but effectively we've got you know, a, a model which has allowed, I think, quite successful trading on the streets with the opportunity for uh, people to um, have a meal and to have a drink um, on on the street in the way which is not unusual in so many other European countries. But we, you know, that, as I said, that may not be welcome if you happen to live beneath it. And one of the things which is so characteristic of Westminster generally and the West End, not just my wall, but the central part of Westminster, uh, more generally, is this delicate balance between residential immunity and commercial activity, because mm -hmm. I believe it's a strength, as I alluded to before, that we have mixed activity within both our buildings and areas, but it's also a challenge to ensure that there is a fair and equitable balance between people trying to get a night's sleep and people wanting to have a night out. Thank you. Um, Alex, I think you've got a question. Alex? Yes, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and uh, I'd like to say a special word of thanks for that uh, earlier insight into life on the streets and the complexities of that. Uh, I'm a church warden in my local area and it's um, it's been quite a challenge for us also, but on a much, much smaller scale, I believe. But I, I just wanted to uh, really ask you about um, a more straightforward question. What does a typical day look like for you? Or is there such a thing as a typical day? What what things might it embrace during the course of a, a typical day? Uh, as Lord Mayor or with my other hat? I mean, presumably as Lord Mayor. As Lord Mayor, yes, yeah, sorry. Should have said. Well, it, it, as, I, as I said uh, earlier, this has been, you know, the most unusual of years. I mean, normally um, Lord Mayors would, would, in a quiet year, would do um, six or eight hundred events. In a busy year, a thousand or twelve hundred events spread across the mayoral year. Um, so you can, you know, you can see that that would be several events a day, and that, of course, reflects the diversity of Westminster. So in the morning, you might be going to see a school that's just opened a, a new garden in the corner. Um, in the afternoon, there might be, um, you know, a, an opportunity to go to, um, you know, a, a nursing home or somewhere to see people um, who um, perhaps can't get out and about. Um, then there would be, uh, you know, a range of activities with, uh, which would be um, sort of um, receptions or meetings like we're having today where we could uh, uh, do things and, and and then alongside that there would be the formal occasions because part of my role is to be Deputy High Steward of Westminster Abbey that's part of the, um, the role of the Lord Mayor of Westminster so we have a close association with the Abbey in normal times there would be many occasions which would be shared with the Abbey and the Abbey being as it were the nation's uh, church, a you know, parish church. In normal times, for instance, there would be formal, you know, large funerals or, or weddings or, or celebrations, um, and all of those nearly have gone by the board. I did get the opportunity to attend the um, the uh, 100th anniversary of the Battle of Britain. Um, sorry, uh, of the um, of the, um, the un unveiling of the uh, unknown warrior, and. One or two other things at the Abbey, but in normal times it would be regular things. And because we are the centre of diplomatic activity, centre of parliamentary activity, there will be those formal occasions as well. Now, basically, all of those have been cancelled. So whether it was 
Chelsea, whether it was West End Live, whether it was Pride Parade, whether it was, uh, you know, whether it was state opening of Parliament, Trooping of the Colour, um, everything went. So atypical, but what I have been able to do is to do as many of those things that I can do remotely through Zoom, um, through Teams, through podcast, through uh, uh, social media. Uh, we've been able to do a range of things which perhaps previous Lord Mayors have not necessarily chosen to do, whether it's on Twitter or on um, any of the other uh, media. Um, but a, a typical day at the moment is far less active than a typical day in, a, in an ordinary Lord Mayor's term, but I do try to cover as much of the ground within Westminster, both um, physically and thematically, as it's possible to do. As I said, it's extraordinary what goes on in Westminster. And you think you know a building, you think you know an area, you think you know an organisation, but actually, until you go through the front door, until you interact with them in the way that we're doing now, you know, you, you don't really know how they tick and how it really works. So it's been, well, I've been able to do it, it's been a wonderful education for me. Thank you very much indeed. Has anybody else got a question? Any hands up? I have a question from um, new vice president of the club, um, Angela Style. She's been worried for some time that there are double yellow lines out, outside. I promised her I would uh, um, ask you this question. Um, yes, there are double yellow lines outside the National Liberal Club. And um, she'd find it much more convenient if there was a single yellow line. And I think she's not um, on her own in that. I just wondered who, who is the person to approach and what's your view on that, if, you're, if you can give a view, please. <laughs> Well, I, I, I suppose I oughtn't really to give a view because that's outside the sort of ceremonial role, but I'll give you a bit of a steer, as a, if I may, which is that uh, there are two things at play in, in relation to the particular geography of your pub, which is not only Westminster's traffic people, but as you're aware, you're within the security zone, and we um, have to, as a local authority, liaise very closely with the parliamentary authorities and the security teams as to what the arrangements are for uh, on the street on street parking and where it can safely be and where they want to keep areas uh, clear for periods of time for, uh, for the reasons that they that they are obviously uh, most closely associated with and concerned with um, that having been said you know there are processes which can lead to review of these things and I think that the person at the council that you should probably um, broach this with in the first instance is Kevin Goad, who is in charge of highways and... Um, and Kevin, what was the last Kevin name? Kevin Goad, that's G-O-A-D. <laughs> okay. Um, and I can make absolutely no promises as to what the outcome would be, but at least he would be the person who would be able to guide you through um, the process and all the rationale for the uh, arrangements as they currently Okay. Have. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, not Alex, I just wonder if I might be asked, uh, able to ask a, a follow-up question, which is on a slightly different tack, uh, which is that um, how is the City of Westminster responding to the kind of sustainability agenda and the, the climate emergency? Has that featured as part of your year or is it is it going to be uh, a big issue for you in the years to come? Alex, it has featured and I think it's going to be a, a big issue for all of us. Um, the council has declared a, 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 a climate emergency. We've done a number of things in relation to seeking to lower emissions. We've had specific lower emission zones. We've increased the cost of parking and, and uh, resident permits for uh, more polluting cars. We've, um, we've worked with the Westminster Tree Trust and others to try and get as much tree cover on our streets as we can. Uh, we have, um, we've, uh, supported uh, quiet routes and cycling schemes. We've widened pavements uh, to look at the balance between um, the different modes of transport and trying to shift those modes towards non-polluting walking or cycling. And I think one of the most successful things that we've done is to look at freight consolidation. And freight consolidation prior to our input might have meant that you had five different trucks coming at five different times of the day to deliver the same thing. 
um, and by consolidating uh, and uh, putting those together, we have reduced the number of delivery vehicles and reduced the number of uh, rubbish trucks quite significantly. So when we upgraded Bond Street, at the beginning of that process, there were 59 companies that came to collect rubbish, 59 different trucks, 59 different sets of, of lorries, etc. Working with um, the New West End company and with the Bond Street traders, we've got that down to four, and we're hoping to get it down below that. So by you know, we've really got rid of a large number of polluting vehicles going up and down Bond Street, taking one from here, one from the other end, uh, etc., and, and then taking them off to uh, a dump somewhere or to uh, to go for recycling. And we've tried to do that with other deliveries. So instead of having five different people uh, delivering ice to to um, uh, to up to bars or you know lots of different people bringing in fish or wine or whatever. We tried to work with them to consolidate those deliveries. There is a, a particular example which you may not be aware, which is the uh, the market which used to be part of the British Home Stores on Oxford Street, looking over to uh, Cavendish Square. Um, they have um, a large number of small food operators in there, and it's a condition of their um, of their occupation there that they must source their ingredients and their generic things. Obviously, if they've got a specialist thing. They can't, but their, their generic ingredients have to be sourced from a central provider who then um, takes all their stuff to a place at Park Royal. And twice a day, an electric lorry comes in from Park Royal to deliver. They're not allowed to get them from anywhere else. And that gets rid of 30, 40, 50 unnecessary journeys. So we see all that as a model, working with, um, with um, the likes of the bids, you no know, Victoria bid, um, NWEC, North Bank, um, you know, um, Baker Street, etc. Working with them, working with the large landowners like Shaftesbury, we could have the ability to do those things, not only through um, encouragement, but also they can put terms into their leases to make these things happen. Uh, and by working with all of those, we've, we've made significant steps in improving the quality of air in the central area. It's a work in progress. Thank you. Um, uh, does anybody who hasn't had a question got, got a question? Um, Dan, do you have a question? Ah, oh, Beatrice, Beatrice. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this uh, event, very interesting. Thank you for all the intervention that are interesting too. Sorry for my uh, so poor English. Um, now with the COVID, more and more people uh, have started to, to work from home and some uh, people enjoy it. And uh, some company are also happy of that because uh, they can save uh, money from the cost of the office and things like that. So do you think uh, there is a risk that uh, uh, people are leaving the central London to, to live in the countryside and uh, continue to work from uh, home for most long, uh, for uh, from now, for for long term uh, uh, vision, and uh, do you follow this kind of uh, of things about um, with inquiry uh, inquiry uh, uh, to company to 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 anticipate uh, the evolution of the 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 rate of uh, working home people and the, the change that could uh, happen also in the, not only in the office, but also in the residency in Westminster. Sorry for my poor English. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 um, <laughs> thank you for that. And I think that you, you know, you've raised a, a, a number of issues. Um, I think that the, 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 the fact is that in the same way as um, aspects of retail, I think, have, uh, there have been changes which have been accelerated. I think aspects of people's way that they have worked have been accelerated through things like Zoom, through um, through um, people's um, willing or having to work from home. But it's fine for some people. It's not fine for everybody. And if you've got space and you can, you know, you can have a meeting like this without the distractions of other things. 
But if, for instance, you know, you're two young people living in a one-bedroom flat, um, somebody's trying to negotiate the terms of a complicated lease, somebody else is trying to trade, you know, what it may be, you know, you've got the phone going, you've got, you know, somebody coming from, the, it's not ideal. And I do think that the idea that the, you know, that the office is dead is, is, is a statement too far. And I think that for a variety of reasons, not least of which that we're actually sort of generally sociable, gregarious people, you know, uh, people like interacting with other people. I think that we will move back towards something which would uh, will be a balance between working in the office, getting together as a team, and realizing that you can work from home. Because, you know, a certain group of people, myself included, who are perhaps a, a different age and stage than younger people who found that their, you know, um, their preferred option, um, you know, used to think, well, working from home was a bit of a euphemism for not doing very much. Um, I take that back because actually a lot of people have been extremely, extremely productive and extremely helpful by being able to do the compromise of working from home. But also, you know, we're all, I think we've become tolerant of the fact that the dog jumps up or that somebody's screaming in the background or somebody playing music. I think as we move back to something closer to normality, perhaps that tolerance might become a little bit frayed. And people will say, actually, you know, I'm paying you 500 pounds an hour to advise me. I don't want your cat jumping in and out of the photograph, you know, uh, uh, all the time. I don't know, I may be wrong, but I, I, I do feel that there are aspects of an office which you can't replicate electronically. If I think back to my own initial training as a solicitor, it's not just the, um, you know, the, being able to speak to somebody, it's seeing how people conduct themselves during the meeting, how you deal with a difficult negotiation, how you deal with a difficult client, the language, the body language, the nonverbal communication, uh, and how you chair a meeting. You know, sometimes you can, if you're chairing a meeting, a raised eyebrow can be very effective. Um, but if it's not seen on the Zoom, then people carry on, you know, and uh, it, it, it takes on a different complexion. So I do believe that there will be a move back towards policy, but not necessarily exclusively. And I think there have been some positive moves. I don't know whether you saw that Boohoo, who is a, 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 an online retailer, have just spent £75 million pounds buying a large office building in Soho because they believe that teams work better when they kind of uh, cross-fertilise and interact with each other. So that's interesting that something uh, at that end of the, uh, of the, of the new gig economy type approach actually recognizes the benefit of uh, of, uh, of working as a team. So I don't know, the jury's out, it's early days, but um, I don't think we're gonna see um, huge um, voids in terms of the offices once the current uh, position settles down. But as a, you know, I said earlier on, I think we've got to be alert to the fact that we may have to mix and match in, you know, in different areas. And, uh, and change the mix, that offices are still very much, in my opinion, can be part of the mix. Your second point about people moving out of London because they can, yeah, in a way, people have always done that at a certain age and stage, perhaps if they've had kids and they want a bigger garden or a garden or they want space. Um, again, I think some of that has been accelerated by uh, the willingness to work from home. Whether we will see the pendulum swing back on that, I don't know, but I do believe that the space left behind will be filled by other people who perhaps don't have those commitments, who actually choose to live in the center of a wonderful city like Av, so they can walk to a restaurant of their choice, a hundred different cuisines, or they can walk to a theater, or they can walk home after, uh, after you know, um, a night out at a club. And there are, you know, I think that will fill back with people who've got perhaps different priorities. We'll see. Thank you very much. Um, has anybody else got a question? We're getting close to the, to our hour and a quarter, uh, or an hour. Um, what about Dan? Have you, have you have you got a question? Or I believe his Ella? honour. I believe his honour had a question, Mister. Uh, oh, sorry, Charles. Charles. Charles, do you have a question? Well, well, I, I I do. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. No. Well, Lord Mayor, say, thank you so much. Um, the, the depth and breadth of your uh, work and your understanding and sensitivity has been uh, really quite an inspiration, I think, to us all. 
the question I wanted to ask, and I realized the meeting was coming to a close, so I was actually saying perhaps I, we should leave it. I mean, you've obviously shown great concern and compassion for those who are homeless, because one of the things that is needed, of course, is social housing. And you said there were 21,000 um, council houses in, in Westminster. But of course, you have extreme wealth and extreme poverty. And it is necessary that ordinary folk who do some of the mundane jobs have got somewhere to live within a striking distance, really, of, of employment and opportunity. And I really want, just wanted to ask about that. But as I say, it may be a bit late to ask what's rather, rather a big question. Well, again, at the risk of sort of entering into policy as opposed to, uh, to uh, my, you know, my current uh, role, I, I would say that I think Westminster benefits from having a mix of housing. And we've got 26% of people in social housing, but we also have a tranche of people who are in, um, in housing, which is uh, not um, subsidized in the same way, but is, it is um, nevertheless at the low market price for a whole range of reasons. But you're absolutely right, we have a city of great contrast where people are living in 100 million pound houses, and as we've heard, people living on the, on the streets. And I think the answer to that is to build more of all tenants, social housing, of, um, of subsidized housing, not necessarily subsidized to the level of, uh, uh, of council, so that we have and can maintain uh, mixed communities um, with um, the benefits of having wealth and the benefits of people who don't have wealth being close to their place of work. I think one of, one of the, the problems that has arisen was uh, that council housing, when it was originally built, was built for working people to be close to their place of work. Council houses as currently occupied are occupied with something in excess of 70% of people who aren't in working, who aren't in work. Uh, and therefore um, their, their contribution is, is different. They're not going out to work. They're not, um, they're not uh, uh, you know, being part of the community in quite the same way. So that is a challenge, not just for Westminster, but across, uh, you know, across the piece as to how do we ensure that uh, the people who are on um, modest salaries can afford to live uh, close by their places of work. Um, I would hazard a guess that if we had more property, we would help, help to address that. And I've certainly tried to support what the council has been doing in, uh, in rebuilding um, some of their uh, property to provide more homes uh, across the spectrum of tenure. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, we Time, time, time is nearly up, and I'd like to um, ask Trevor, who's been very quiet, uh, to give the formal vote of thanks from the club, and then I just want to tell you about the next meeting. Trevor. Uh, Trevor, by the way, runs the Commonwealth and European forums and runs lots of events um, on fantastic um, range of activities. Over to you, Trevor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, Lord Mayor, on behalf of the National Liberal Club Business Forum, I'd like to thank you very much for being with us this evening, virtually. Um, and we now know more about uh, the role of, of Lord Mayor in Westminster and the role of you as first citizen of Westminster. But tonight's interactions with the uh, membership have been fantastic because we've covered over eight questioners, a huge area of um, activity that you you had very uh, informative views on and I've certainly learned a, a huge amount but I think for me the best question was a double yellow lines I must have <laughs> Angela her question was was asked um, and I'm certain people will contact your your, your colleague in, in due course but we've had seriously a, a wide range of issues on a whole range of social issues as well as the the business agenda and they are both areas are, are really interrelated. You can't do one effectively without the other. Um, so on behalf, Lord Mayor, of your friends here this evening at the National Liberal Club Business Forum, I would like to thank you again um, for being with us virtually. And we look very much to seeing you in the flesh, as it were, at um, a future occasion uh, at the National Liberal Club. And it's been very good to know that you've been with us at the National Liberal Club previously. So on behalf of everyone, thank you very much, Lord Mayor.